people and the stakes that we in Bangladesh have. You understand this is a very, very important topic for Bangladesh. Being the most densely populated country, this maritime space in the form of exclusive economic zone is a great uh, opportunity for us to harness the potential. And our young generation, I think, still doesn't know enough that this nation had been historically a seafaring nation. And not only we have the economic importance, but the political, strategic, and environmental importance is of utmost importance for Bangladesh, being a very climate sensitive, climate change sensitive country. So with this initial, I'm not an expert really on this field, in this field, but with this initial uh, statement, I will welcome, I invite our Vice Chancellor, Professor Pagan, uh, for your opening remarks. So. Thank you very much, Professor Khan. Uh, welcome everybody. I'm not going to list all the names because then I always Hello. miss somebody and uh, then people get upset. So, I would, yeah, I would again like to ask all of the participants who are not speaking to keep your microphone on mute. Otherwise, we have too much background noise. Now, this is the third webinar in our series. And this is uh, the result of uh, collaboration between or among uh, three premier institutes. Uh, the first one being uh, BIMRAT, the second one being uh, ICAD, and the third one being IUB. And listening to these uh, webinars closely, two different, very, very different scenarios can emerge in, in one's mind. One scenario, in one scenario, in the future, what we will have is clean rivers flowing into Bay of Bengal and Bay of Bengal teeming with life, full of resources and people living along those rivers and around that bay, live in harmony and co cooperate and collaborate in harvesting resources of that bay. But there's another scenario that was hinted at during the discussions and that scenario is that polluted rivers would erode the land as they flow into bay and the bay is a big soup of plastic with very, very few marine life in there. And the nations living uh, along those rivers and around the bay are in conflict, fighting over power, influence, and over limited resources in that bay. The only way to make sure that the first scenario is what will happen, not the second one, is as I pointed in the first the opening to the to the first webinar, collaboration and evidence-based decision-making. That can get us to realize the first scenario. And I believe that the importance of these webinars is to create the awareness that is necessary to mobilize the resources working for the first scenario. So I am eager to hear what uh, your thoughts today will be on uh, Blue Economy and how we can, in the future, tap into these vast resources in a better way without destroying the environment. So I hope we'll have a very productive discussions today. And again, thank you everybody for joining us. Thanks. Professor Khan. You're muted. Yes. Now, now I think you can hear me. Yes. Yes, we now can you hear. Me. Now you're muted again. Uh, it shows that I'm not muted. Uh, okay, okay, now it's okay. Go, Go on. Go okay, okay. So, uh, Vice Chancellor, you have laid out the broad, uh, brass broad canvas of what we are supposed to do. Now, let me invite uh, Ambassador Tariq Karim 
uh, who is not uh, who has not just been a diplomat but also an academic uh, since his early years of the career, and uh, he is now uh, a senior fellow at the Independent University of Bangladesh. So he will share uh, briefly the proceedings of the last webinars. So Ambassador Karim, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and welcome all. Um, I, I will, uh, the Vice Chancellor has already given uh, a, 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 a sort of a, a broad picture of what we set out with. Uh, the first webinar, which was held on September 15, was our inception webinar. The chief guest was Professor uh, Gohar Rizvi, advise, International Affairs Advisor to the Honorable Prime Minister. And uh, the keynote address on the overarching theme uh, on likely geopolitical, geostrategic, and geoeconomic scenario in the Bay of Bengal region and implications of, for Bangladesh was delivered by the Foreign Secretary, Mr. Masood bin Momen. Uh, apart from the keynote speaker, there were two discussions, Professor Imtiaz Hussain of uh, uh, IUB and uh, uh, Professor uh, 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 the, the distinguished fellow Professor Mustafizur Rahman from the Center for Policy Dialogue. We also had some very special guests, Ambassador Naoki, the Ambassador of Japan, and uh, uh, among them. And Mr. of course, Ambassador Shahidul Islam, the Secretary General of BIMSTEP. Uh, it was an excellent seminar. It was an eye-opening in many ways. It led to the second sem sem webinar uh, in which the keynote speaker was our own Professor Salimul Haq, the director of ICAD. Uh, there were two panelists, Professor Anamitra uh, Danda from the ORF in Kolkata and Professor uh, Anamika Barua from the IIT Guwahati. Uh, again, they highlighted many of the environment and ecological uh, uh, aspects of the Bay of Bengal, uh, how it affected not just Bangladesh, but the entire literal countries. Uh, one, of the reason, one of the things pointed out in the discussions which took place after the keynote speaker and the panelists had discussed was that we also need to take into uh, take note of the ecological dangers that were looming and, and on which further deep research needed to be undertaken. And those hopefully will need to serious uh, research being undertaken in collaboration. Um, our partners, BIMRAD and ICAT, uh, uh, together with IUB, I hope that we will, we will, after the series of webinars is over, get together and launch a series of action-oriented agenda for us to bite into and present options to the government to consider in future uh, consideration of this very, very important commons. Uh, I would, in fact, even describe it as an existential commons for our future prosperity and development. Uh, with that, I will close. Uh, all, all our participants, will we will share a consolidated summary of the proceedings for you to be able to take note of. And those of you who wish to follow uh, individually or in collaboration will then be able to do so. Thank you very much, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador Karim. Now, please allow me to lay uh, the ground rules for our session today. First, we'll have the keynote speech by Rear Admiral Khurshid Alam. Then uh, two panelists will share their comments. And then we'll open up the floor for comments and discussions. Uh, distinguished participants, you can uh, post your comments in the chat box, as well as also you can raise hands. But we would certainly like some of the participants to raise the hands and come on our camera and make comments and questions. So. With these, let me first introduce our, our outstanding speaker today, uh, Rear Admiral Khurshid Alam. He has a distinguished career in his life. He uh, 
is an outstanding expert, I can say, in this field, globally renowned expert uh, on maritime issues. And um, he uh, was intimately involved in the maritime uh, delimitation uh, negotiations with Bangladesh, between Bangladesh and Myanmar, Bangladesh and India. And also he attended all these uh, UNCLOS and many other international issues, uh, negotiation issues. He was the first president of the ISA, International Seabed Authority of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, uh, in his first assembly, 22nd assembly uh, in 2016. Then he was defense advisor of Bangladesh in the, uh, our high commission in Malaysia, and then chairman of the Mongla Port Authority. But overall, above all, he's a member of our class. He is an academic, uh, a researcher, and uh, currently also he teaches uh, the, at, the, at Dhaka University and at Southeast University. Uh, but for the last few years, um, uh, Rear Admiral Khushid Alam holds the position of the secretary at the Maritime Affairs Unit of our Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So with this brief introduction, let uh, us have the honor to welcome uh, Rear Admiral Khurshid Alam for your speech. Mr. Alam, you have the floor. You can upload your presentation. Thank you very much, sir. Today's chair, Professor Mizan, Professor Dr. Milan Pagan, Vice Chancellor, Independent University, Ambassador Tarek Kurim, at number ago. Slide at number. Uh, distinguished guests, panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings and good morning to all of you uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Of course, at the beginning, let me thank the Independent University and in particular the Vice Chancellor and my esteemed colleague, uh, Ambassador Tarek Karim, and also the BIMRAD for organizing the webinar series, The Economic Importance in the Bay of Bengal. Um, I am today delighted to be invited uh, to deliver the keynote speech. I have a number of slides. I hope you can see them. Uh, quite a good number of slides. Uh, I have to take it along with the slides only because of uh, the nature of the issue of the blue economy um, dictates me to use the slides so that it is best understood by the audience and others. So with that, let me, let me start with the first slide, as you can see here. Um, <clears throat> uh, the, the, the sea is blue, it's really blue down in the bottom, uh, but the coastline you see with the coconut tree is not that blue, you know. So most of us are associated with the coastline, the beaches and others, but we really hardly have an opportunity to go into the <clears throat> deeper part of the sea and actually evaluate the activities, the activities of the sea, whether it is oil drilling, gas drilling, whether it is a submarine or a gas carrier or fish and other resources you have. So that's the problem we have, uh, but I will try to change the channel. Uh, okay. Uh, as you can see here, <clears throat> over 3 billion people depend on marine and coastal biodiversity for the livelihood. Globally, it is about $3 trillion market for per year. Fisheries, of course, is a, the bulk of it, employs about 200 million people. And of course, sea is getting polluted and eutrophicated. And roughly 80% of this pollution originates from land including plastic, <clears throat> but shipping is also another important issue which we will be coming along to discuss. In Bangladesh, as you know, we are a riverine country. We have been studying since our young ages that we are a riverine country. So that has made us know the matric Bangladesh, meaning that wherever the river finishes, Bangladesh finishes. So we hardly knew what is happening out at sea. So if you can look at this diagram, Bangladesh was actually cut off from the main sea by two lines drawn by our two neighbors, both India and Myanmar, 
which are equidistant line, and you can see here in the slide, that only gives us, uh, you know, uh, only 100 nautical miles of sea. So that's the situation. <coughs> Next. As you can see, we mostly visit the sea beaches. So what is happening <coughs> down into the sea areas or the deeper into the sea areas, we hardly know. And that remains a very difficult part of, uh, uh, the, you know, it, especially the people living in the cities like Dhaka and the decision maker and the policy maker. That's why for long 35, 36 years, we did not have a very time boundary. Next. So uh, let me uh, the, let me tell you that some of it um, <clears throat> that what law of the sea says. Law of the sea says that twelve nautical miles from the baseline is the territorial sea. Twenty-four nautical miles is contiguous zone. Two hundred nautical miles is exclusive zone, and three hundred fifty nautical miles is our continental shelf. And beyond two hundred miles, it is high sea and beyond 350 nautical miles, which is called the area. So out of this, you need maritime boundary, take a second. You need maritime boundary for continental shelf, exclusive economic zone and territorial sea. So our honorable prime minister actually thought of it, that how to maximize uh, the resources of the sea for the people of Bangladesh. So in 2009, we went to the court, and before going to court, we had about 40,000 square kilometer of area. And after the court's verdict in 2014, we had 118,813 square kilometer. If you look on the left, uh, Germany had um, almost 16,000. They also went to court in 1967. And after going to court, they got another 12,000. So having the same coastline, Germany has 28,000. We have 118,000 square kilometer. Next. If you look at the South China Sea, you can feel that it's so much clumsy and everybody is claiming Vietnam, uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Brunei, Philippines. So there's a, actually a mess. So a boundary is required to have the resources to be collected by the uh, coastal country. And this is what, is what we got. From the coastal area, if you see, it, it is about 660 kilometers long. And depth-wise, if you see about 2,300 meters of depth, uh, that is our area. So whatever living resources in the water and the non-living resources under the water in the seabed and subsoil of, belongs to Bangladesh. Uh, the, an estimate, the total gross marine product of the seas is estimated to have been about US dollar 24 trillion. And out of that, the human being or all the countries are only using 2.5 trillion US dollar. So that means there is a scope for everybody uh, to go to the sea. Yeah. Of course, the uh, sustainable development goals, uh, out of 17 goals, as you can see, the goal 14 is exclusively dedicated for uh, sea areas, which was not there in the Millennium Development Goals, and that is in the biosphere. If you see in the wedding cake format, of course, biosphere is the first one. Then, of course, comes the issues of the society, and finally, the economy. The healthy ocean is a must. And that's how we have, in fact, from 2014, from September 2014, we have formulated the dimensions of blue economy, which includes, as you can see in this slide, whether you call it fishing, uh, shipping, tourism, or uh, oil and gas energy sector. All these includes in the uh, blue economic sector. And the but main idea is that, uh, you know, the social functions, the environmental and economic, all these three are interlinked and must be maintained at all costs. As you go along, I will express first, let me say about the fisheries. As you can see the top left hand side, the, our fisheries are in the center of the slide. Those are small boats, they fish from our coastline to about 25 to 30 nautical miles. And then you have these steel body trawlers, which in the bottom right hand corner or in the center, uh, those go another 60, uh, 30 to 40 kilometer, uh, kilometer. So totally, we are harvesting only 60, 65 or 70 kilometer from our coastline. Rest about 600 kilometer, we do not have any deep sea vessel. We did not have before also, now even after uh, the verdict in 2014, 
uh, though people have taken licenses, but still we do not see any of the thing. As you can see in this one, the much of the concentration of the fishing boat is within 40 kilometer, 40 meter of water contour. All these dots, you know, the green are wooden boats and the red are the trawlers. So they are all inside this 40 meter contour, which are actually destroying our seabed, as well as the all types of fishes we have within our um, near coast area. Well, <clears throat> this is the figure for the fish we have caught. Of course, we have done very good in the land, but uh, if you talk about the sea, uh, there are 9 million tons of fish have been caught in the Bay of Bengal by all the countries. Last year, our share is only 120,000 metric ton, and that's a very dismal figure. Why? Because we do not have this long line fishing. To catch tuna or the big fishes which are about 100 meter or 150 meter down uh, under the sea, those fishes we cannot catch because our nets are hardly, it can go 20 meter, 30. So both long line and part sailing, which are deep sea fishing, are missing. You would need almost uh, 235 million tons of uh, fish. Right now, it is about 179 million tons of fish are being produced, either capture or culture. But then we need this uh, extra fish because of the population increase and nutrition. So unless, until unless we actually plan for it, then you know uh, our total income is 155 million dollars by fish export. Whereas Thailand earns almost seven to eight dollar, even India uh, seven to eight billion dollar. Indonesia about uh, include even India about $5 billion. We have a scope. This is a scope. First the scope is case culturing in the open sea. This is what you can see. The technology is there, but we can start, but it, it, we are yet to start. Most of the countries, most of the countries are, you know, uh, this is, you can see all these big fishes are being cultured these days. Nobody is going, but look at our, uh, even Hilsha. We have been trying to culture Hilsha in our ponds for the last 50 years, if we would have tried in the open sea, probably by this time would have been successful. And culture would have ensured us free supply, regular supply, and also cost. In our fishing trawler, there is hardly any technology uh, we have not imported. But look at uh, commercial fishing, hardly we use the technology. But look at Norway, you know, they have started in 2008, um, the even salmon farming. And by 2008, right now, they're the number one in the world in salmon export. So if countries like Norway can do it, we can always take the technology and the other resources needed to start off. If we look at the fishery uh, shipping, as you see these golden dots represent the Arctic Golden dots uh, represent the uh, ships, uh, most all the all the ships in the world. There are almost 150,000 uh, ships of all tonnages. They are carrying about 11 billion tons of deadweight tonnage of cargo from one country to another. So without this, uh, it would not have been possible to have the, you know, the export and import of the countries. Next. In Bangladesh, you see we have about $90 billion trade of export and import. These are carried by 3,600 ships, which actually visit Chittagong, um, Paira, and Manglapur. But we pay as a freight charge around 9 billion US dollar to all these 3,600 ships for bringing our import and also for uh, taking our for, for taking our uh, cargo because we have only 62 ships in our registry. That's the difficult part. And also if you look at the container, you need two to three covered vans to carry the goods from uh, Chittagong to Dhaka or vice versa. And that actually congestion increases, pollution increases on the road, accident, spare parts, and cost increases. Next. And what we could do, like Europe, you know, we could carry our cargo um, by the, um, uh, you know, the rivers. But this has, we have the Pangao terminal, but still we do not have the ships to bring the cargo from Chittagong or Mongla. If you see in this picture, the 64% of the containers are being originated from Asia. 64%, 8% originates from Europe. So Bangladesh must prepare itself. 
so, so that we can we can handle more containers in our ports and with efficiency and with appropriate appliances. Look at our business. It is increasing almost 15 to 15 and a half percent almost every year. It is not like GDP, it's increasing. So for this, we need ports. We have all these three ports, as you can see, Mongolia is right 85 kilometers inside, Paira is 45 kilometers inside, Chittagong is 15 kilometers inside. That means all three ports are river ports. And they are almost at the, at the uh, especially Chattogram port is almost at the end of the full capacity. So we need to increase the extra capacity. And also you can see there is a new port being developed at Matarbari by uh, Japan. And that's the port will actually give us after 2024, 2025, the facilities to bring in a big, uh, <clears throat> next. You, you can see these are the shipping routes and preschool. preschool. Uh, you can see the daily sailings to various ships, uh, various areas, and also the number of days it takes uh, from the main routes. So all these uh, are there, but then we need to probably move faster, you know, uh, in this area to improve the facilities of our um, ports and other ancillary facilities we need to double up. Next. Next, next. We do that. You see, the biggest ship is 24,000 TUs, 24 equivalent ships in the market. But we, the ships which comes to Bangladeshi port are on the left hand side. They carry only two and a half thousand to three thousand containers. So we can, we need to increase the depth of our port so that we can accommodate bigger container ships for the benefit of business. Another area is coastal shipping. That's also very important. We have signed a, uh, an agreement with India, but we need to move along with the coastal shipping. These are the ships which actually can be used for the coastal shipping. We have quite a number of them because uh, the 62 ships, they are actually international trade, but these ships could be utilized in the coastal shipping. Shipbuilding, we are doing good. Uh, we are exporting ships. We have almost 100 odd uh, you know, shipbuilding yards. Uh, right now, we are producing 0.84% of total world production. But if we can increase it to 1%, it will give us about $200 billion market. So that's a big market. So to sustain this sector, we need seed money and continued financial patronage and the banking system, which right at the moment we don't have. So, Shipping is a value addition, as you can see. If we have a shipping industry, so many of the value addition, including design, drawing, supply, the lever, crew, agent, and everything. So it is a manpower intensive industry. That's what we must uh, uh, ensure, you know. <coughs> Ship recycling, yes, um, there are three, four countries. Next to them. <coughs> four countries uh, do, does this ship recycling Bangladesh, China, India, Pakistan. But sometimes, no, no. Sometimes Bangladesh is first, sometimes China is the uh, first one. But the only problem, if you see this slide, that means we are also polluting quite a bit, you know, because the seas are almost uh, in the coastal waters, these are cut into pieces almost openly, you know, without any protection. So that needs to be taken care of. Biotechnology, you know, using their seas, plants, and uh, various fishes to produce health and cosmetics, food agriculture. We don't have this industry right now, but we need to go along. These are the biotechnology expanding the value chain. If we want to, we have to move along. Next. Uh, you see the corn snail and others, people are using, uh, you know, fish and Caribbean sea squid for producing endolis, which are actually used for cancer. And halaven also for, uh, from deep sea spawns. So there are countries which are using this. Uh, this is around $2 billion market, but Bangladesh, we are here to start. <laughs> these are also produced from the um, uh, algae uh, uh, el and the seaweeds. Next. But we are happy with the dried fish only, but we must move away from this one. <laughs> we must also move to the non-conventional fisheries, oyster, mussel, and clam culture. As, are, as you can see, a cod fish. This is from Iceland. Every part of the codfish they utilize, even the skin. Next. Even the skin they, they use to make jackets, you know. Uh, so the very costly one. Next. So look at 
the Belgium coastline is only a 67 kilometer and our coastline is 710. So Belgium exports almost a billion dollar of <coughs> biotechnology. So we need to probably move along very fast. Tourism, as you can see, we really do not have much. It is for $1.3 trillion industry, but still we are not there. Only one ship which came to Bangladesh is Silver Discoverer. Uh, that was actually visited uh, Mohishkali. And that's the only thing we really didn't have any other ship. Next. <coughs> Oil and gas also, as you can see, 32% of the global hydrocarbon are recoverable from offshore. Uh, it is increasing, but for us, next. You can see in Bangladesh, we, uh, we had 28 sea blocks before going to the port. Now we have 22 blocks. Closer to our blocks in the yellow, Myanmar has got gas. And in the yellow near Indian coastline, they have got gas. But in our area, from 14 to till today, um, we have not been able to carry out substantial seismic survey for exploiting the seabed and other areas. Emerging marine energy, renewable energy, as you can see, uh, solar, offshore wind, yes, offshore wind is not very effective in Bangladesh, but tidal, next job, tidal energy could be a big one. Uh, wave energy, as you can see here, could be a big one. Uh, tidal energy, South Korea is doing uh, for both tide, you know, uh, low tide and high tide. It is initially maybe costly, but not, but we are, uh, the salt pans, as you can see, we put polythene on the ground, allows seawater to come in during high tide, and the sunlight evaporates, and we have the, <coughs> you know, salt. But we do not produce the pure white salt, which could be exported, which produces in Gujarat, because we do not use any machine for producing salt. Next. Offshore wind, yes, we have been uh, uh, carrying out exercises and also studies, but not very successful in Bangladesh waters. Next. You look at the submarine cable, uh, we have two, as you can see. There are almost one million kilometer of cables all over the world under the sea. And uh, they produce almost $10 trillion worth of uh, business value every day. $10 trillion every day. And we have no clue what is happening and who are the owner of this. This is actually uh, equal to GDP of three developed countries, as you know. We have done this single by mooring offshore. Yes, this is giving us some service. Next. And also for the LNG LPG supply, this is also right uh, near the Mahashkali channel. Uh, we are getting the LPG and LNG. Submarine mining, yes, it is probably not today. We will have to wait for some time to have the submarine mining from the Indian Ocean, whether it is polymetallic sulfide, neutrons, and others. But in this slide, whatever heavy mineral you see, zircon, deutile, these are actually, I have, um, in, in fact, published in my book. These are available in our beaches. Uh, the only thing we, we are yet to start uh, extracting some of these. Some beaches we won't be able to, but some beaches we should be able to. Next. These are also deep sea mining. Uh, in this area, India, Singapore, China, they are doing deep sea mining in south of uh, Indian Ocean, but probably we'll have to wait our turn. Uh, what we are doing is a gas hydrate. Gas hydrate are nothing but is the same methane gas which are actually uh, solidifies into ice uh, in the bottom of the sea. So we, are, we have carried out, a, we are carrying out a study to find out how much gas hydrate are available in Bangladesh waters because India has already detected gas hydrate there. So maybe our next year we'll be able to say how much gas hydrate we have next. So, uh, and, and if you can see here today, there is about $9.6 billion it comes from our blue economy. We have carried out a study with the European Union and this is what is our figure, but we can increase that, let's see. Because uh, these days you can have the technology, you know, you can go up to 11,000 meter to find out what is happening. Previously, it was not. In 1980s, we could go only 50 meter. Next. And also the maritime domain, I know what is happening out at sea, whether it is on the surface or is underwater, we really do not have any equipment or any surveillance capability uh, which we need to develop. Next. Uh, the uh, pollution, as it has been mentioned by the uh, Vice Chancellor, pollution, yes, is a big problem for us. Next. You can see also the plastic pollution uh, liters are there. Next. 
And if you see this picture, there are about 150 million plastic uh, metric tons of uh, plastic in 2014. And by 2050, the figure will be reversed. There will be 850 million ton, metric tons of plastic and fish will remain more or same. So if you actually throw a net, you will, might get ma uh, much of the plastic than the fish. Next. Also the invasive species, you can see in the Bay of Bengal, there is a big dot. That means there are more than 150 to 250 species are there, which is actually carried by, carried in the ship's bottom. We need to also take action on that. Next. And also because of eutrophication, as you can see in the Bay of Bengal, Ambassador Tarek Karim has been trying to, uh, you know, uh, say this, the dead zones have already been created in the, in almost in the, in, the, in the Bay of Bengal, very close to our um, area. And that's mostly because of the pollution and the eutrophication we cause from the land. Next. So coastal habitat, coastal habitat we need to probably develop by both ecosystem-based and physical engineering and also uh, socio-economy, you know. The right-hand side, those uh, tetrapods uh, are, are the best to, to give into the coastal belts and areas. And also the down below, the, you know, the greening the coastal belt by mangrove forest. These are the best option which we can have for the coastal habitat facilitation. <clears throat> These are marine spatial planning. That means for every uh, type of fish or every type of areas we can have is special planning, uh, separate the areas for shipping and others, so that the various stakeholders, they exactly know which are their areas. This we have not started, but we need to do it. <coughs> the most important is the training and education for our, because uh, we have not started, like in India, they have started in 1960, teaching oceanography, but in Bangladesh, we have started in 2013, after the Myanmar verdict was uh, received, so 2013, 2014. So we need this much more than probably, so skill, human power is not there. Now, Honorable Prime Minister has established Bangabandhu Sheikh Pujar Maritime University, Bangladesh Oceanographic Research Institute, Oceanographic Department in Dhaka, there is Marine Science in Chittagong University and also in Kuruna and Kotoakali University, but we need more human resource so that they can sit in the ministries and can plan for what would be what would be our target out at sea uh, through which we can go. Right now, the low hanging fruit is probably the best option. That is the fish and fish oil. And from there on, we can move to cosmetics, others, and pharmaceuticals. As you know, Brazil is the first country in the world uh, in producing cos uh, cosmetics. If you look at these pictures, sir, I always show uh, upside down. It's Bangladesh is down, and you look at up. So if you look down uh, southwards from Bangladesh coastline, we are not a small country. We are a very big country. I call it our third neighbor and the oceanic country. Because um, if you want to go to Myanmar, you need passport and visa. If you want to go to India also, you need passport and visa. But you go down south, you don't need a passport and visa. What you need is a ship and some skilled human resource and with some, I know either it is a fishing, or for research and for any other you know, biotechnology-oriented equipment and everything. You can go to the Indian Ocean, and through Indian Ocean, you could go to the Pacific and also to the Atlantic to catch fish or other resources and bring it to, uh, for the teeming millions of uh, Bangladeshi people. One thing, what you, you, know, you cannot go somebody else's um, area, you know, uh, 200 miles. Otherwise, it's all free. I'm going to finish, but looking at the example, you see this example, what I keep saying that everybody has a capacity, but has this capacity been turned into capability? Then there is a problem. Uh, you see a 1300 cc car has fallen down in the water, it needs to be picked up. So a five ton crane has been brought in, next down. And it has been attached, but the crane, died. crane had the capacity of five tons, but he, he did not know, the operator did not probably know, did not develop the capability that if it is fully stressed, its capacity will not remain five ton. So when he tried to push, as you can see, that is what it happened. So somebody suggested no problem, we may get a bigger crane, 15 ton. So another bigger crane was brought in. As you can see, it has been tied down. But again, this crane had the 15 ton capability. No, I get, I get to this. Uh, crane had the capacity of 15 tons, but um, the, 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 
the operator, he did not have the capability that if it is fully stressed, it will not remain so. So when he tried to push them up, you see, the same thing happened. So that's what, next. That's what the Albert Einstein has said, that doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not going to happen. I'm sure all of you who have listened today are very meritorious and you know what is to be done. I would request all of you so that in Bangladesh we can increase our capability, not depend on the capacity only. If we increase our capability, we can go to sea, bring back the resources and change the fate of our teeming millions in the future days and thereby we complement the effort of our prime minister to make a developed country by 2041. Thank you very much, sir, for patient hearing. And I'm sorry to uh, take more time than it was related to me. My apologies, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Admiral Alam. No, it was a pleasure. You had taken time more, but it was a pleasure for us to listen to your uh, excellent presentation with all the visual pictures. And uh, uh, let me share a fact. I had the privilege of working with you for a very short time in 2009 when Bangladesh was in the process of ratifying the UN Convention on, uh, on the Law of the Sea. Then uh, Barisha Morshad was the advisor on maritime affairs at the ministry. So I remember uh, with pleasure that we have worked together for some time to prepare the ratification uh, paper for the government of Bangladesh. So thank you, Admiral Alam. So now let me have the honor to invite our panelists. First, I think, as the program shows, Professor uh, Selim Raihan. Uh, Professor Selim Raihan is a member of the faculty of the University Economics Department of Dhaka University. Uh, and he's also the executive director of the uh, Association of Economic Modeling in South Asia. Mm -hmm. He is an expert on uh, empirical research. He's a senior, senior research fellow at Manchester University. From where he had the uh, his PhD in economics. Um, he had the experience of working with many multilateral organizations. So with this, let me invite Professor Selim Raihan to share your comments, please. Thank you very much, Professor Khan. And I also thank uh, the organizers uh, for inviting me to this very important event. I hope I'm uh, clearly audible. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, after this very excellent and comprehensive keynote presentation, actually, I think as a panelist, I have very few things to offer uh, to this very uh, uh, esteemed panel. But I thought that uh, as an economist, let me just share some of my views. Uh, and I think the very, uh, uh, I must congratulate the organizers for uh, you know, uh, taking this very important issue for discussion. And uh, these are the prospects, so the future prospects of Bangladesh. I can, I can see that. And I'm, I'm very much hopeful that we'll be able to exploit the opportunities and uh, fulfill the uh, uh, prospects what we have uh, in front of us. So my, uh, the first point is that Bangladesh, uh, as very rightly pointed out by the uh, keynote speaker, that Bangladesh enjoys all the virtues being a sea-linked country. Uh, and if we compare Bangladesh with many other developing countries, even in, in Asia, in South Asia, some of these landlocked countries, which are geographically constrained, uh, Bangladesh doesn't have this constraint. Bangladesh has this kind of uh, given or history, uh, geographically given added advantage. So I think we must exploit this advantage properly so that whatever uh, uh, challenges or prospects we have in front of us, we can solve and we can exploit them properly. So before getting into the uh, discussion, I thought that we need to have in front of us the kind of the broad context. If we look at the past trend and even the recent, uh, uh, situation, uh, recent uh, performance, we have a high economic growth over the last uh, uh, more than a decade or so. And Bangladesh has moved to a lower middle income country from a low income country in 2015, uh, according to the World Bank's classification. And Bangladesh aspires to become an upper income country by 2031 or even or, or within a decade from now. So this is, I think, uh, 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 and also Bangladesh wants to become a developed country by 2041, as mentioned in the perspective plan. Uh, even if we look at uh, the other issues that uh, it's not only the graduating from uh, lower, min, uh, lower income country to lower middle income country, Bangladesh is also graduating from the LDC status. 
So we know that in 2018, Bangladesh made the first evaluation criteria. And the second evaluation, uh, evaluation is going to happen next year, 2021. And uh, we are hoping that the second evaluation will also go through uh, without any constraint. Uh, that means by 2024, finally, Bangladesh will graduate out from the LDC status. So graduating out of the LDC status has a lot of opportunities, no doubt. And we can talk about this. And especially this discussion of what we are having today is very much linked to how we can actually uh, see these opportunities and uh, exploit these opportunities properly. But it will also bring a lot of challenges too. So these are the things we need to keep in our mind when we uh, kind of uh, project our development trajectory uh, in the coming years uh, uh, from now on. We also have uh, larger development goals to meet by 2030. We have the SDGs, we know, and the uh, uh, keynote speaker very rightly pointed out those SDGs. And also now we have COVID-19. Uh, and because of COVID-19, we may have to rethink many of our development strategies and priorities. So these are the kind of broader context I thought that we should keep in our mind while we uh, discuss uh, the opportunities of uh, what we can have from linking or integrating with the Bay of Bengal uh, initiatives. So what are the opportunities? I think as mentioned in the keynote presentation, there are many opportunities to gain from the Bay of Bengal uh, and especially through mineral resources, fisheries, shipbuildings, energy, and many more, trade, and of course. Uh, but my point is that uh, we just not looking at the opportunities, we must also need to focus on how we can enhance the value addition. You know, because I just give you one example. Uh, in the case of fisheries, uh, my understanding is that we have still very little value addition. Uh, but there are scopes for processed fish, fish byproducts, as mentioned in the keynote presentation very rightly. But for that, we need to develop our capacity. And it's not just capacity to catch the fish uh, or to process the fish, but also to develop our quality infrastructure or quality and standard. Because we know that it is going to be these fisheries, whatever we extract from uh, Bay of Bengal, uh, these are meant to be primarily meant to be exported. And we know that how, how much... Uh, how difficult it is in the export, major export destination, European Union or North America. Uh, and in order to meet the standards, we need to develop our standard capacity as well. And uh, so I'm not getting into the details, but that's what I thought that uh, we need to mention. Uh, when you look at the challenges, uh, uh, actually the keynote presentation talked quite a lot about this, but I thought that just to flag a few uh, of the uh, important issues, our sea related infrastructure is weak and in many areas is very weak. So for example, when it comes to trade logistics, because since the sea port are, it's very, our 90% of the trade, uh, the sea related trade is actually uh, happens to Chittagong port. We all know that. And, and how important Chittagong port for Bangladesh's economic lifeline, we all know that. But Bangladesh is seriously lagging behind its competitors when it comes to the trade logistics. For example, the logistic performance index of 2018, the latest one of World Bank, Bangladesh was ranked at 100 out of 160 countries. And if we look at the six components of the logistic performance index, customs, infrastructure, international shipment, logistic quality and competence, tracking and tracing and timeliness, all these are very much related to our competitiveness. Bangladesh had similar scores with a group of countries from Sub-Saharan Africa, and probably Bangladesh would not really want to be there, would not uh, would not like to be there, because with, these, with, with that kind of, uh, with that country group. And if we look at Bangladesh's major competitors, they have much, much better scores than Bangladesh. Bangladesh made some improvement, no doubt, over the last one decade, but in a world of intense competition, the absolute improvement in trade logistics is critical but what really matters is the relative improvement, improvement in trade logistics. So what I'm trying to mean is that though Bangladesh made improvement, Bangladesh's competitors made improvement at a faster rate than Bangladesh. So I think this is, this is something what we really need to keep in our mind. And heavy reliance uh, on Chittagong port is not really helpful. We need to explore development of other ports. And here comes Mongla, Paira, and other ports. And the port will, uh, should have lab facilities and trade related, all logistics services need to be integrated. Also, uh, I think it is very critical that when you talk about ocean economy, and actually the keynote presentation talked quite a lot about the emerging sectors based on the ocean economy. 
And these emerging sectors face a number of supply side and policy induced challenges. So it's not that uh, we will just talk about the opportunities of the sectors, but we need to look at the what kind of policies we are providing, policy support. Are we actually addressing their supply side constraints? Uh, so these things need to be taken into account very seriously. So what are needed? My final point. So we need an integrated, integrated and holistic approach, not fragment, fragmented. So I think this is something we need to uh, take it very seriously because the ocean economy or the blue economy can't be, uh, uh, we can't treat it fragment, uh, with a fragmented approach. And this is very much linked to our development of our, our overall economy, non-ocean economy or non-blue economy, if I uh, mention the, uh, the land part. So it has to be integrated and holistic approach must be there. There have been some initiatives, but they lack coordination. And also I think it's very important that the timely and cost effective implementation of the projects which are linked to the ocean economy, and it remain a big challenge because that is not related to only the ocean economy, blue economy, but also related to many other projects of the infrastructural development projects in Bangladesh in recent time, uh, where we are seeing that the, this a big challenge is the timely and cost effective implementation. We also need regional cooperation too for the effective use of the opportunities offered by the Bay of Bengal. And here comes the beamstick. It has the promise, but the progress has been uh, so far very slow. Uh, I also uh, want to highlight two other points, which I'm quite sure Professor Shahab, uh, he will mention too. Uh, but I thought that uh, the growing tension with Myanmar is a challenge and need international support for the solution of the Rohingya crisis. Because if we have this tension, the whatever opportunities or the kind of prospects we have with the blue economy, uh, we will not be able to exploit it fully. And also very sensitive issue, uh, especially the issue of chi China versus India, can also block many of the development initiatives of Bangladesh in the Bay of Bengal. The China factor has both economic and political dimensions. India is definitely concerned about Chinese presence in its neighboring countries. However, while India has reservation about China, due to its bilateral political relations, most of the other South Asian countries actually see China as a major trading partner and a source of FDI. So as far as Bangladesh's position is concerned, that's what I really want to highlight, that Bangladesh needs investment from both China and India and for its economic development. In this context, it's more of the economic interest than any geopolitical interest that should drive Bangladesh's relations with India and China. And also so far, Bangladesh compared to some other South Asian countries, here I'd like to flag this, uh, that, that it has been able to maintain a reasonable balance of relations with China and India. Therefore, for Bangladesh, the issue is not China versus India, but India and China. My final point is that, very final, is that we should not consider Bay of Bengal primarily for extraction. Uh, and that is, the, that is the danger that we treat as a kind of extract area of extraction, extraction of mineral resources, extraction of fisheries, because over extraction can lead to environmental degradation and loss of eco balance. Economic impacts can be linked. And also, if we look at the economic impacts, this kind of extraction based appro uh, extraction approach or extraction based economy can also link to dust disease, where easy extraction can lead to suppressing other sectors growth in the economy. So I'll stop here and over to you, honorable moderator. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Raihan. Thank you for your comments, wide comments, including your environmental and strategic issues, not just on the economy. Now let uh, us invite uh, Professor, uh, Professor Shahab Enam Khan, uh, a professor at the Department of International Relations from Jahangir University. Uh, professor Khan had a distinguished academic career having his education from Dhaka University, Jawaharlal Nehru University, as well as Harvard University. Professor Khan also have the, has got the experience of working with many, many multilateral organizations. So uh, over to Professor Khan for your comments. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I assume I'm audible. Um, thank you very much, and particularly my uh, sincere appreciation to the secretary for uh, enlightening us with absolutely uh, the 
basic information as well as the advanced level of information. Thank you, sir, for that. Uh, perhaps uh, even Professor Selim Raihan has touched upon uh, many uh, uh, critical uh, pending issues, which I think uh, over the period of time, uh, uh, Secretary and the government of Bangladesh will be looking into. Now, my focus will be uh, slightly different uh, as, and I would uh, certainly take it from uh, Professor Selim Raihan, is BIMSTEC. Now, BIMSTEC is one of the very few institutions that we have a solid interest in. A, it sits between South and Southeast Asia. B, it sits on the top of Bay of Bengal. And of course, it has a greater outreach, which also includes all the way up to Thailand. Now, there is a discussion going on whether uh, BIMSTEC should be expanded or not. And if BIMSTEC is expanded, naturally the whole territorial issue of Bay of Bengal and beyond will essentially come within a greater geospatial uh, entity. Now, even last uh, last week, I was listening to uh, the talk of uh, Sri Lankan Foreign Secretary at uh, Bimrod uh, National Maritime Institute uh, dialogue, and where he emphatically and quite uh, quite boldly stated that the South Asian countries as well as the ASEAN countries should have a common narratives and common standards for the governance of Bay of Bengal, given the geopolitics that is unfolding across the world. And perhaps uh, one of the agenda that matches with Bangladesh government is the uh, faith on the multilateral institutions in which the multilateral institutions actually sets standards and norms However, the question remains that the existing standards and norms will be adequate uh, in the future, coming future or not. Now, even if you look at the uh, International Seabed uh, uh, Agency, where our Honorable Secretary was involved with, has recently um, contracted 21 contractors uh, for 15 years to do ocean bed exploration which starts from um, Clarion, uh, Clarion Clipperton Zone to Indian Ocean to Mid-Atlantic to South Atlantic to Pacific. So we're roughly talking about almost um, more than a million square kilometer of area when unmanned technologies will be used, new technologies will be used, and definitely uh, the ethical context of these exploitation or exploration will eventually become a question. Now, even if I take the case of uh, uh, India, immediate neighbor of Bangladesh, has undertaken $1.1 billion uh, sea exploration proposal, which will sort out their, their crisis uh, in terms of ocean energy and, of course, seabed mineral resources. So you're now seeing that within our immediate neighborhood, these explorations are coming up. And uh, in that case, again, I'm referring back to Admiral Khurshed when he talked about the technology remains as a critical factor. And this is a concern for not only Thailand, Bangladesh, or India, but also Sri Lanka. Now, why that is the issue? The very simple reason is the ships or the fisheries being uh, fetched are using uh, old traditional uh, methods. And therefore, the question of the surveillance of these fisheries and the exploitation done by these fisheries remain uh, largely unreported. And even the Sri Lankan authority claimed uh, uh, a couple of years back that they have spotted 40,544 foreign trawlers in Sri Lankan's uh, territorial water. And the question is, that is only the reported one. And on that anecdote, they also said there are more than that. Now, even if you look at the ASEANs, yeah, they're the producers of 25% of world's fish. That says that uh, essentially that is also the reported one. Again, if you look at the Thai documents, if you look at the uh, Indonesian documents, there is a growing concern about the undocumented fishing that is taking place. So therefore, we do not have the number. Even if you look at illegal fishing going, uh, transforming into massive overfishing, uh, has created, uh, comes with another critical issue called plastics and 235,000 uh, 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 metric ton of plastic has been recovered from the Thai offshore. 
and which means 51 trillion plastic particles were present. And that was only, uh, only the reported one. Now, what essentially becomes, uh, comes out of this plastic? Plastic will be another key area of conflict in future in the Bay of Bengal. Why? Because this will be a question of burden sharing. Because the more plastic you use and send it to the sea, more pollution will take place. Now, the question is who is going to take the burden of this particular uh, particular plastic uh, infusion in the water. And perhaps uh, the Professor Raihan has mentioned that uh, uh, the infrastructure and infrastructure sharing and infrastructure setting up will, uh, will be another question. Therefore, the environmental crises uh, looming from plastic, looming from uh, uh, river bed or uh, river pollution will be another factor where the politics of information sharing and politics of information gathering will be a major concern for the countries or the stakeholders. Even if you look at the cases of uh, climate change, ocean acidification, plastic pollution, noise, existing offshore mining, and of course, the new level of marine geoengineering, and perhaps I won't take uh, the Bangladesh's efforts to dismantling uh, ships as a as something uh, environmentally a, a sensitive uh, engineering, but perhaps the new level of marine geoengineering that we are seeing in Chinese offshore and the Japanese offshore is also going to keep us into some sort of back 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 end of the back end of the whole situation. Even by 2025, this data has just recently come out that uh, six out of 10 ASEAN countries and four out of eight South Asian countries will be massively mismanage their plastic waste. Now I'm focusing plastic once again, because this is the immediate crisis that we are, we are looking towards. Bangladesh, India, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Thailand, Indonesia, Philippines, and Vietnam will rank as the top uh, polluters in the world. So therefore, you now see that not only the South Asian countries are part of it, Southeast Asian countries are part of it. Therefore, BIMSTEC ASEAN certainly has a convergence in terms of their work, uh, in terms of their mandate in protecting the marine life. Every year, even in Bangladesh's Bay of, Bangladesh's Bay of Bengal, uh, Bangladesh side of Bay of Bengal, we are now seeing two lakh tons of uh, plastics entering the water, which means uh, we are going to be one of the top 10 plastic polluting countries in the world. And that's exactly where Selim Raihan's point of uh, policy harmonization and new policy to be introduced essentially comes in. And even if you look at the Ganges and the Indus on which uh, huge population leaves, uh, and of course this is a part of our cultural heritage, are the most polluted rivers as well. So therefore it is not only the case of Bangladesh, but also the case of collective response. Even, even if you take Mekong's salinity is also increasing. So that comes with a very interesting phenomenon. This is one of the terms that I was quite enthralled with. It's called the pink gold rush. Now the pink gold rush is about shrimping or shrimp uh, farming. Now what one of the study was saying that look at this uh, shrimp uh, cultivation as a collateral damage. A, a trawling industry is processed and sold at a fast, uh, uh, I mean, uh, these are the uh, trawlers and others, they sell uh, the, uh, the uh, waste of uh, these particular shrimps uh, for fast growing poultry and agriculture industries. And of course, when they do that, they essentially, it does not resource, resort to ethical exploitation of the shrimp. Uh, and the prawn that is available in the side of Bangladesh's water. Even in 2017, a multilateral uh, team uh, essentially found a very large dead zone, which uh, Secretary and uh, uh, Professor Raihan has already touched upon, uh, which uh, has uh, not only the sulfur oxidizing bacteria or marine worms, Few creatures uh, can, uh, which lives within the oxygen depleted waters are also eroding. So which means this zone, which uh, this study has found is now spanning more than 60,000 square kilometers. And certainly it has a deep over effect, 
not only on the Bangladesh side, but also in the, the members of the ASEAN too. So therefore, the challenge will remain in terms of policy planning, as uh, Professor Raihan has said. There will be an issue of uh, technology information sharing, which will be a critical factor coming up with the given relationship between Bangladesh and Myanmar at the moment, as uh, Professor Raihan rightly mentioned with the state of relationship between these two countries, uh, information sharing, collaboration, and ethical uh, fisheries or ethical mining will essentially be ch challenging. So therefore, we have to really converge uh, between uh, BIMSTEC and ASEAN. And the last point that I have is obviously, uh, what are the things BIMSTEC and ASEAN can immediately do? The first thing is obviously, they should take a lead to control plastic pollution. And this is, I think, low-hanging fruit at the moment. So I don't get into the greater or the longer or the complex or sophisticated initiatives, but at least this will be a good initiative. And uh, BIMSTEC and ASEAN and perhaps uh, BIMRA, which is one of the key uh, agencies in Bangladesh, should also focus on the genetic libraries of deep sea organisms and the complex chemistry they produce. Means that will be essentially a great source for pharmaceutical industries, for cure of diseases, and obviously that will help us in expanding our biotech industries. Of course, after COVID, uh, the biotech industries will be one of the key factors for all the countries. And henceforth, Bibra has a greater responsibility to really facilitate these things with our existing institutions, starting from Buet to medical universities and so on. So therefore, the genetic resources that we have can also be produced not only for the cure or the pharmaceutical industries, but also for the uh, fisheries and making uh, economy much more resilient uh, in terms of catastrophic uh, natural disasters. So therefore, the access to the remote deep sea is currently limited. Uh, limited, but we need essentially uh, more money and resources, which I think um, the ambassador sitting with us, the secretary, will eventually be looking into in future. So that's my two cents on this. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Khan, for your uh, wise and uh, insightful comments. Now uh, let us open up the floor for com comments and questions. So uh there are participants i think you can uh post your comments on the chat box as well as open come up with uh on camera even maximum for two minutes if you want to make comments so the floor is open for discussion you can pose the question either to the keynote speaker as well as to the uh, panelists, to our two discussions. Okay, let us uh, look at the chat box, what comments we have. But in the meantime, I will uh, request some distinguished speakers, present uh, uh, participants, if you want to come online. Uh, may I just uh, add one point? I see the chat is disabled. Uh, probably that may restrict to type something. Yeah. Okay. So I will request the controller of the system to make it visible. Yes, I also don't find. Okay. So here yeah, I don't find. Do you see any comments? I don't find any. My chat box works fine. Yes. Okay. That chat is disabled. Yeah. 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 It's visible. So, um, no, the honorable not. speaker, keynote speaker, will you respond to some of the comments? Expected moderator, I have raised my hand. Yes, sure. Uh, I'm uh, Admiral. Kazi Sarwar. Yeah, uh, yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah, sure, sure. Please come on. Okay. Thank you, sir, for giving me the floor. 
I am um, Kaji Sarwar. I represent Bangladesh Institute of... Are you, can you hear me, sir? Yes, sure. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kaji Sarwar. Um, I represent Bangladesh Institute of Maritime Research and Development, in short, BIMRA. So, first of all, I would like to uh, compliment the keynote speaker, who was my teacher while I was in the Navy, Admiral Khushid Alam, and also two of the panelists for, for an outstanding presentation on a topic which is so important and relevant for Bangladesh. Now I'm going to, uh, uh, about this uh, Blue Economy Initiative, what I'm, uh, in, I intend to do, give some practical persp perspective from my experience working uh, in the Navy and also outside the Navy. So I will talk about, talk a very, uh, very operator's point of view. So I, I wish I would be forgiven for being so practical and on hand experience sharing exercise that I'm about to undertake. So the first point is the, uh, uh, when we talk about blue economy, I would, uh, I always uh, like to fall back to a comment made by Professor Imtiaz. He always used to say that for the blue economy to be uh, successful, we really need a blue mind. When he talk about blue mind, he talk about the population of Bangladesh to be aware about the potential of the resources, blue resources that we have. Now, to make them aware, we, we really need to grow awareness among, the, among the, uh, the population of Bangladesh to realize about the potential of the sea resources and also to make sure that we can conserve them for the better interest and the best interest of the country and make optimum use of those resources. So that's how we can create blue mind. And for that, we need a massive general awareness among the entire population of the country. In that respect, I am I'm very uh, uh, honored and privileged to say that Bangladesh BIMRAD is BIMRAD along with uh, IUB and ICAD is making a humble effort to grow awareness among the uh, population of Bangladesh about the potential of the sea resources and its optimum utilization. Having said that, let me now very quickly focus on three, uh, three very practical points that I'm going to uh, highlight. Number one is uh, our keynote speaker have talk, did talk about growing the human resources for shipping industry, which is very, uh, very genuine and very uh, pragmatic uh, prospect, which is a very pragmatic perspective. Now seafaring is a very laborious task. And in the seafaring industry, Bangladesh, you know, since Bangladeshis are, you know, uh, adept at, uh, uh, at labor intensive job. I had a feeling that uh, we, all, we always had this feeling that in the ship, in the ship manning industry, ship, uh, in, the, in the shipping industry, Bangladeshi uh, sailors, Bangladeshi uh, shippers would do well. With that, that in view, we had a number of marine uh, training institute that came up in Bangladesh in early 80s and late, nine, uh, in, in late 80s and early 90s. You might have realized, you know, there were so many private marine academies. Those came up in Bangladesh for training these uh, these uh, crew for the uh, foreign ships, and then for that matter, for Bangladeshi ships also. But this could not sustain in a span of three years, three to four years. All these marine academies, private marine academies, had to disband dis 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 their operations. The main reason uh, we we did a study on this why. Could not they succeed? We did a study on this and we realized and we found out that because of the trust deficit, deficit of the image problem of Bangladesh. Why? Because the documents that we, we prepare from our uh, government agencies, especially uh, from the shipping, uh, DG shipping and other uh, government offices, the certification that we provide for these uh, shipping crews are sometimes uh, you know, are sometimes not genuine. They are counterfeit sometimes. So that you know over a period of time create a bad image about uh, our credibility in the international shipping market. We, we lost that market, and within a span of five years, uh, that that industry went down. That industry was bombed. So there come the policy, the issue of policy harmonization and holistic approach that. Uh, uh, 
Professor Shahab and also Professor Selim Rahan uh, talked about. So we need to do this harmonization within the, uh, the policy makers and also policy analysts and also uh, the researcher like us that we are trying to make some dent in, in de developing the, the maritime industry of Bangladesh. So this is one. The next thing I, I, I would, I'd go very quickly, you have only, I only have two minutes. Next thing I want to talk about shipbuilding industry. Now you realize the shipbuilding, uh, our keynote speaker has said that if uh, we could raise the, um, the quota, the uh, quota of Bangladesh, I mean the uh, percentage of shipbuilding from 0.8 to just about 1% of the global requirement, it would have been a, about like $9 billion uh, that we could add to our national exchequer for that matter to the business. Now, you know, the shipbuilding industry, it started with the Big Bang again, and it did very well, and it started doing well. We started exporting ships to many countries. But whatever, in the, in, in the long run, we again, uh, that industry got stalled. Then why did we, with, we also did some study, and there was, uh, there was these uh, findings that the shipbuilding industry, while we was not given proper, incent, was not incentivized from the government, uh, you know, government agencies also financiers because because of there were some regulatory mis you know, regulatory i will not say misunderstanding regulatory regulatory gaps somewhere in the enforcement for the for example government was not initially accept uh, agreed to accept that uh, the shipping industry shipbuilding industry is a export oriented industry because if garments is the export oriented industry but shipbuilding is not an export oriented industry because there is an export-oriented industry, you get a lot of uh, fringe benefits and also tax holidays. Shipbuilding industry was not given this, that tax holidays. So it started slowing down and it's, it's, it's still slowing down. So this again goes back to my, uh, my uh, previous submission of that policy harmonization and the holistic approach from the government level. level. Last point, I would just, um, just take a, a few more seconds and talk about Online fishing. Now I was in Maldives, and uh, uh, you know I worked in Maldives for some time, and we have uh, you know negotiated with the Ministry of Fishing and uh, DG Fishing to introduce deep sea fishing in Bangladesh. Government was very kind. Prime Minister herself was very very uh, keen to start deep sea fishing in Bangladesh, and she has uh, given out many uh, uh, given out few lot of licenses. To some of the uh, uh, some of the uh, the trawler owners to conduct uh, deep sea fishing, but again uh, to do a deep sea fishing or at least to find out what are the resources and what are the um, uh, how much fishing resources do we have at the at the uh, at the deep sea, we need to be member of international tuna commission. I again fall back to the government and said that. Let us uh, let us uh, uh, be, uh, join the International Tuna Commission, and I say very nominal fee, and then uh, we, we start from satellite imagery. We can find out what the, the what is the fish stock we have in the deep sea resources. But then again, uh, there was a lack of uh, coordination between us. I, I take the blame on myself also. All of us are involved. Why I'm saying all of us are involved that because of that uh, uh, holistic approach and this policy harmonization at various sectors of the governance is missing. That is what is uh, needed in order to boost the blue economy output of, the, uh, of Bangladesh. Thank you, sir. Thank you for giving me the floor. I just wanted to, uh, show, uh, to bring to the notice some of my concerns, some of my experiences. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ambassador uh, uh, Admiral Sarwar for your wise comments. Yes. Uh, so I see one comment from uh, our ICAT colleague, Shakib, who is asking uh, a question about the scoping of the blue economy, that we just not only uh, let us think of the economic aspect, but uh, in a comprehensive way, total, with a total perspective. So a uh, reaction from the keynote speaker, uh, Admiral Alam. or from the panelists also, you can have. Hello. Admiral Khurshid Alam. Admiral Khurshid Alam. Yes, sir. 
and and another comment also addressed to your admirer Khushir Dalam uh, to uh, dwell upon uh, your idea of uh, capacity versus capability. So if you can, then like uh, students of marine issues like us, we can get to have a better understanding. Thank you. <clears throat> let me let me sir go a bit closer so that I can see the. Uh, question. Yeah, sure, sure. Between capacity and capability. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, sir. Well, um, uh, the. <laughs> The first question is the gap between the capacity and the capability. In the marine sector, I think this is uh, quite evident, sir, uh, what we have seen, because um, first of all, we really do not have qualified human resource uh, because the oceanography subject as a whole is being taught uh, in the Bangladesh universities uh, by 2014, uh, it has started. So in 2014, people with Bangla in graduation and degree, they could do a one-year master's. So only full course of four years oceanography have started only recently. So as a result, people who do not have experience of the sea, it's very difficult for them to <clears throat> actually plan and uh, uh, go to sea and, and get, the <clears throat> get the resources. Uh, it is also in the in the in the in the fishery sector. Let's say there is a fisheries academy. Yes, we do produce a lot of people from there, but these days they do not stay in the fisheries uh, ship as a captain or others because they would like to go to merchant ships. So that means the experienced people we are producing uh, through our academies, they are not staying with us. They are in fact going to. Uh, other other countries, you know, uh, and uh, on board big uh, merchant ships and other. So th those are the uh, problems. And um, what we have done from Maritime Affairs Unit that we have <coughs> carried out a study, and through that study we have uh, in fact found out there are about fifty plus projects which can be taken by various ministries. So we have published in the form of a booklet and then given it to the ministries so that it becomes easier for them to take the project uh, because otherwise the money is not going to come. So that is being done uh, and I hope that some of the startup industries uh, uh, will, be, will be initiated sooner than you know, we think of. Coming back to Admiral um, uh, Kazi Sarwar Hussain, about his comments, let me let me tell you that the awareness to bringing awareness among the general population of Bangladesh, it's a big uh, asking. You know, uh, you have been in the navy. I have been in the navy. You know that our naval budget remained a very meager budget till 2010, till we achieved this victory. So that means the sea victory was used as a prime mover for the naval budget to be increased. And in last 10 years, the number of ships we have received, previous 20 years, we have not received the same number of ships. So you need a prime mover. Problem here in Bangladesh is um, we are competing with the governments. So the rich man's son is always the owner of a garments industry. Because if you invest money, you can take it from the bank about 100 crore, invest about five crore from your own pocket. And you know, you. Within five years, you have, uh, you know, uh, the big car, uh, in also a house, and as I say, and also a beautiful woman. So a, a boy of 35 years old, if he has a house, a beautiful car, and a regular source of income, why should you go to sea where it is all, you know, uh, the water is very muddy, you don't see what is there or not. So that is where we are lacking. And also I can tell you, that for 35 years, we did not settle our maritime boundary. Can anybody or could anybody say that was there any hue and cry in Bangladesh? Let me give you one example. That we have ratified the UNCLOS law of the sea in 2001, uh, 14th of July, in the last cabinet meeting of the, uh, the our military government in the last time. <clears throat> From that day, we had 10 years time to sub submit our claim on continental shelf. 
to the UNCLCS. Myanmar, where there is no talk show, nobody even told them, they submitted the claim in 2008. India, Sri Lanka, they submitted in 2009, but we did not do anything. When we joined the ministry in 2009, uh, we carried out the seismic survey, and by the time we actually submitted our claim, uh, that was in 2011, like, well, fair end of the, our total time. So in the court, in fact, both India and Myanmar ridiculed us, and they said, why Bangladesh to be given continental shell? They could have submitted the claim you know, much before. And we really did not have anything to say because the government is a continuous process. In the international court, we could not say the BNP could not do it or uh, the caretaker government did not do it. Uh, so we had to revise the ways. You know, we actually cited Rabindranath Tagore's one of the poem in English. You know, uh, sorry, um, uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Pagan, you know, this is a Bangla Tagore's film. We should say the God Almighty has every time in hand. We are human beings, we live a very short time, and for Bangladeshi people, we need the resources most. So that's how we got the continental shelf claim, you know. So the people in this country, you know, we, we can talk it out, but then it is uh, it's difficult. Also, the another issue, what you said is, it's not the issue of only CDC. You see, you have to think about, uh, in the Marine Academy, we have one year training. And then the boy is a steel cadet, goes on board a ship, and he does another one year practical training. Till that practical one year training is done, he cannot join another ship as a qualified fifth officer or fourth officer, whatever you may call it. So in Bangladesh, problem is, Yes, in 80s, we had 27, 28 ships in the, in the arsenal of Bangladesh Shipping Corporation. So we could train almost 200 boys. But now, we, the BSC was reduced to zero ships. We now have six ships, that is uh, three to four years. For a long time, we had uh, hardly any ships. So Marine Academy producing the cadet, but they, they are not trained. They have not got the practical training. That's why the foreign employment was not there. In addition to the image, you know, that's another um, problem. In the shipbuilding sector, again, you see the problem with, uh, in this country is the banking problem. They need seed money. But the ship, uh, the banking sector never, you know, uh, actually handled the shipbuilding, how it is to be done. Why do they need seed money and everything? So that is the new for them. So they need, also need some time to acclimatize themselves with the peculiarities of this industry and they are doing it and also if you know that um, the in the shipping sector there is a system of advanced income tax so that means if you buy a ship 20 million dollar at the same day you have to pay six and a half uh, percent of advanced income tax which is a quite a bit of money the ship did not earn a single dollar for your country or for the owner but you have to pay advanced income tax so these were the odd things were there we tried now it has been reduced but it has not been eliminated altogether because it is difficult. Bangladesh, you know, that's what I said, it is easier said than done. You know, we, we keep talking on the talk show till 1 a.m. in the morning, but probably useful talking will only help us to get to the, the post, you know. And I can also inform um, uh, Admiral um, Sarawar that we are a member of the IOTC. We have become a member of IOTC in 2015. We are paying 300,000 US dollars for um, being the member of the IOTC. And uh, yes, uh, the long line fishing, there are 19 licenses people have taken, including Bangladesh Navy has taken two licenses. But nobody has got the ship, nobody has bought the ship. So what can be done? You know, these are the problem. We expected that at least Bangladesh Navy Welfare Trust will come forward and uh, invest some money and get this uh, pioneer project into effect uh, into the Bay of Bengal. Now what we have done, we uh, already, Prime, Honorable Prime Minister has approved a project through the government. You know the government can't do business. It will be running at a loss. But still we are trying to do a pilot project of a limited amount of money. Let's see if we can do this. Possibly we will show the way that there is enough fish. And also you have talked about fish stock. Only last year we carried out the fish survey uh, through Fitzroy Nansen, a, a Norwegian ship, which actually was in our waters for 15 days and the survey was uh, quite good. And their result is 
that the fish stock level in the Bay of Bengal has remained as of 1979. So that's a very good news. But hopefully we, with this ship, we could do a little bit more survey and everything else. But the naval officer we put in, into this ship, he did not allow the full function of the ship for fear of submarine operations. So these are also handicaps, you know, maybe a very small, but then it actually hampers the growth of uh, certain objectives in the mission we had. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, uh, keynote speaker, uh, Admiral Alam. Now, uh, please uh, uh, let us invite the Director General of Bimraj, Kazi Commodore Kazi Imdad, who has raised his hand for your quick comments. Sir Commodore Imdad, please come on. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, sure. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And thanks to uh, the keynote speaker, my mentor, and also same as uh, as Kazi Sarwar said, our, our the teacher in the Bangladesh Naval Academy. We do solemnly remember you. Thank you very much also. Thank you other two panelists uh, for their beautiful uh, presentation. So uh, to the uh, speaker and also the panels, uh, I have a few questions. Uh, it's not my suggestion. You say uh, Bangladesh, uh, while Bangladesh tries for the economic benefit from the Bay of Bengal, and at the same time, uh, the Bay of Bengal has uh, become the epicenter of great power competition. Uh, this strategic competition uh, has pushed the Indian Ocean uh, towards a volatile situation. And Bay of Bengal is a part of uh, Indian Ocean and the largest bay in the world. Uh, uh, the volatile situation, even it might be worse in the future days. So given this fact, my first uh, question to uh, Professor Shahabanam Khan, uh, what should be the strategic options for Bangladesh to be benefited from the Bay of Bengal? That's the first one. Second question also to Professor Shahabanam Khan, what are the concerns of Bangladesh while considering the Bay of Bengal engagement? I put the Bangladesh economic engagement with Bay of Bengal. So I coined the term as Bay of Bengal engagement. Uh, that's the two question to Professor Shahabanam Khan. I know his strategies, so he can be able to give a very good answer. And uh, uh, to, uh, as a uh, founder of uh, uh, Bimbrad, Admiral Khrushchev Alam, uh, sir, we, uh, you know, the we Bimrad has come to an understanding with uh, great institution IUB and ICAD. We have government of understanding. The three institutions have come together, and we have uh, carried out. Uh, a, a, in fact, another another uh, seminar webinar is uh, is still there. So after this seminar, uh, you have seen the uh, the headline the. In fact, the economic, politicals, and the increasing uh, uh, the uh, geopolitical engagement with the Bay of Bengal. So, uh, uh, as a, our mentor and founding member, what should be your suggestion? Uh, your suggestion that after this webinar, we can pursue three leading institutions in Bangladesh to strengthen the economy or strengthen the hand of the government to achieve developed country by 2041, as you mentioned. Thank you very much, sir. OK, uh, thank you, Kamado sir. So let me invite first our keynote speaker, um, Admiral Khushid Alam, to respond to the question raised by the DZ of BIMRAT. Then I will invite two panelists, uh, particularly Professor Khan. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> and thank you, Commander Amdad, for the uh, for the comments and the also the question. What, what I believe is that, um, a, a, to be honestly speaking, that Bimrad is the only think tank we have in this country who is actually destined to look after the you know sea, the Bay of Bengal, and beyond. In Bangladesh, others also, the other think tanks, they do, but they do as a, not as a primary function, not as a primary job uh, of them. That And that's the big problem for all of us. 
So, and also, let me tell you, we have talked about BIMSTAC a lot of it, but even if you go into the charter of BIMSTAC, there is hardly any issue on the maritime except one or two, you know, that there are not enough maritime issues because the charter of BIMSTAC was actually developed, you know, by the diplomats. And the sea was altogether out, but in 2008, some of, portion of it has been included. But ASEAN does have, but Indian Ocean Rim Association, which is the another organization uh, with 22 members, where well, Bangladesh is also a member. We are becoming chair next year in October 21, for two years, chair of the Indian Ocean Rim Association. So there are enough things to, to be done. This webinar series, I must thank all the three institutes, including Bibra and also Ambassador Tarek Karim. These are the ways to actually make people understand that yes, there are importance of Bay of Bengal, there are economic importance of Bay of Bengal, geo-strategic importance is there, geopolitical importance are there, so you can come and also make a lot of investment there. So this is that's why I have been trying for the last four or five years, either writing books, writing articles, or even going to television, print, electronic media on the, some of the shows, so that people are aware of this. But tell me, let me tell you that one group which we are not in a position to attract right now is the investor group. So if you can, uh, in the next seminar, or you, know, you can invite the investor group, I would also request Ambassador Tarek Kareem uh, to go along. I have given, presented our case to the FBCCI, MCCI, DCCI, all, uh, with all the options and benefits what can have in the C areas. But people do take time. Businessmen are not, you know, uh, you know, foolish people. They are very intelligent people. So wherever they want to invest money, they must see the benefit and, uh, you know, cost benefit ratio. So if you want to take on the investors next time, including local as well as the foreign, that would be an eye opener for many of the investors in Bangladesh, that there are great opportunities. You can become pioneer investor in the Bay of Bengal. Yes, one of the panelists has said there are policy support problem. Yes, there are policy support problem. Uh, you know, garments industry has not come this way in one day, you know. If Mr. Uh, Deshai would not have sent 200 people to South Korea, you know, or training. Uh, he was a, a retired police officer. So he sent 200 good boys to South Korea to learn uh, how to run a garment industry and what is garment industry. So when they came back in 79, he started the garments. And then all these 200 people, they were the industrialists subsequently. And there were quota initially, now there is no quota. Things have improved. Back-to-back -back LC, we have been able to introduce in Bangladesh. Look at our next country, India. They could not do back-to-back -back LC as of now. Till now, they don't have. So doing garments in business in India is much more difficult than in Bangladesh. So there are ways to innovate and to go to a better system. But we need to discuss what policy support somebody needs. If somebody starts a business like seafood processing industry, it's not doing bad, it's doing all right. But the problem is, you know, one or two, you know, the people who are actually involved in malpractice, you know, like salmonella, you know, salmonella is a big problem. Let me give you one example. Uh, I have without, I'm not undermining anybody. When in 2004, the European Union banned our export of uh, shrimps, uh, cultured shrimps, um, because of Salmonella, you know. So they sent a team they, from Germany, there are three, uh, five member team came. So they said, okay, you have to test it with a machine. And we found out that there is a machine in the, uh, in the science laboratory. When these five people went there and wanted to check how this machine is operated and how they check this uh, question of Salmonella and other things, you know, none of the, officer present there could operate this. So the German delegation leader had written this, I can quote, you know, quote unquote, that I have never seen such an institution with so many of PhDs, total 250 numbers, but none of them knew how to operate a simple machine 
and demonstrate to us that this is what, how we do it. Unquote. So this is where is the capacity and capability. You have PhD, you have master's, uh, you have a certificate, that's your capacity. But if you don't turn into that capability, and this is what is the problem in Bangladesh. We are a talk shop. We must move this from talk shop to real work. And then only probably we'll be able to see some real progress. But I would only say that this three institute, I must congratulate all three of them, including you know, the university, that please continue this process so that Bengal is, you know, comes into the memory of uh, people. If you see the why in the, uh, the Arabs came to Indian or went to Indonesia or others because of monsoon. Indian Ocean had monsoon. So we used monsoon, advantage of monsoon to come and go and do the business from seventh century. So why the Western powers had to wait for uh, 1498? Because they, there is no monsoon there. They had to have the power, steam, or something, some machine, or some other ways to come to India in 1498 when Vasco da Gama came. So we had the advantage. We still have this advantage. But again, I would say that you know uh, the problem, like seafarer is said, one of the greatest problems of seafarer is English, because we don't know English. A ship is probably run by a captain from Philippines, and then uh, there are 50 crews from probably 10 different countries. So the only medium can be good English. Our people, they don't speak English, and that's another big problem. And that's why Philippines is providing 46% of the total 15 lakh seafarers all over the world. We are not there. Of course, China is now taking over, but we are not there because of lack of English. So we need to probably impart English so that we can increase the number of seafarers. Mind it. One captain of the ship, he earns 10,000 US dollar per month. A general ship. A tanker captain earns 15,000 US dollar. Honest mm -hmm. income. And if we want to do this, we have to probably think on that line instead of others and invest more in this sector. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Uh, thank you, Admiral Alam, for your wise comments to the questions. Now, let me invite Professor Khan to respond to the DG of the MRAP's comments. Thank you very Under much. Uh, uh, this is a billion dollar question that uh, DG has actually asked <laughs> that how, uh, what would be the future look like in, in the Bay of Bengal? It has to be seen through three basic prisms. The first prism is the politics of supply line. Now, this is one of the critical area India, uh, Pakistan, uh, sorry, China has long been uh, in making of its access to the Rakhine and Bay of Bengal for uh, its uh, supply goods, uh, not only in terms of commercial, but also in terms of defense. So therefore, this is the first time they have been able to do technologically something sound by using or going through the Arakan uh, mountains and that mountain, mountain range and connecting itself with the Bay of Bengal. Now they have a direct connection right now. So that is one. As a, as a process, there has been another project called Kaladan Project that has come from the Indian side as a part of their access to uh, Northeast India using the Kaladan, uh, Kaladan multimodal initiative. So now you have two seaports sitting there making Bangladesh's seaports essentially being challenged. Third one has come up, which is the Vishakapatnam. Now, Vishakapatnam and Andaman, Andaman there, there is a proposal to build another uh, seaport by the Indian authorities, essentially to divert a large number of logistics goods. And the fourth one is the rise of Trincomalee. And even uh, uh, last week uh, uh, when uh, Bimrat hosted that particular meeting. Uh, Sri Lankan Foreign Secretary was essentially stressing on uh, using, uh, using of Trincomalee as another key strategic port. So that is becoming another factor. So that calls for very interesting uh, uh, tussles between two powers, which is India and China. So that's one set of understanding. Second understanding is the ASEAN Indo-Pacific 
uh, energy contest. So if you look at uh, the current uh, energy portfolio that uh, Myanmar is offering, they have 51 offshore blocks, out of which 38 are essentially within the grasp of three major countries, Thailand's PTTTE, France's Total, and uh, South Korea's Dayu. So now you can see that the Sri Lanka uh, so, uh, Singaporeans are aiming for another uh, block, uh, offshore block, out of the remaining 13. So you now see that the ASEAN uh, in the Pacific interest is essentially converging over there. So the energy will be another key factor. The third factor is the lack of information. If you remember, uh, I, I was saying that the critical factor that will come eventually in a few years of time is information regarding pollution, information regarding unmanned equipments, and obviously unmanned vehicles that will be underwater vehicles. Now, how we are going to monitor these things and what would be the modalities for these things to be uh, deployed in our bay will also be a factor that will be challenging our strategic autonomy. Another factor that is being discussed in the international community, and perhaps this has come after the Iranian crisis, uh, uh, whether uh, the investments or the, or the uh, heavy transportation uh, will require additional security measures. Of course, we are not uh, in a similar situation that has happened in the uh, in uh, those canals. But if uh, but essentially, uh, if there is a tussle going on between Washington and Beijing, and perhaps even if there is a tussle going on between Delhi and Beijing, definitely uh, the uh, investment in in this particular region. Uh, will be quite difficult and that will come with some sort of negotiation or perhaps guarantee, asking for guarantee in terms of security uh, for the investment by the Americans and others. So that is another dimension that we have to remember. The last uh, but not least is the repeated violation of international law. And if you look at bangladesh Myanmar relationship at least seven times uh, Myanmar has violated Bangladesh's airspace, and it has been repeatedly violating Bangladesh's maritime space too. And when you talk about maritime space, even we have seen that uh, Myanmar has repeatedly tried through its public uh, uh, public statements as well as public documentation that uh, San Martin remains their part. So that also shows some sort of act of provocation regularly. So this act of provocation will certainly not keep Bangladesh Myanmar relationship at a very easy uh, atmosphere. And even if we have, we see that the recent amassing of uh, Burmese forces across the border perhaps gives us another indication that uh, it will not be uh, surprising if we see that there is a naval amassing in Bangladesh Myanmar maritime boundary. So we have to have our early warning system uh, in place. And the last um, uh, important factor is if you look at the whole region from the arc of instability factor, starting from Kabul to Kashmir to Galwan and all the way down to Northeast India and of course uh, Rakhine, you see that particular crescent has a spillover effect on each other. So therefore, the contest for uh, strategic autonomy for Bangladesh and perhaps our strategic uniqueness, if we want to preserve it, we have to first uh, ensure that our defense capability is strong. B, we have proper uh, uh, policies in place uh, in terms of uh, resource exploitation, as, uh, um, as the Secretary has rightly mentioned, that we have to have our capacity as well as capability. And the third thing that we have to have is uh, strengthening our surveillance capacity. Now, surveillance capacity will one of will be one of the key determinant when uh, the international investment will come. And we have seen in the case of Persian Gulf, we have seen in the case of uh, Iranian coast uh, that essentially these are the factors that comes up with the international oil companies um, to make sure that they have a better bargaining with us. With all these issues, the Bay of Bengal is not going to be a very happy land anytime soon. And since it will have a lot of resources, it will have a lot of uh, competing forces coming in, 
Therefore, we have to be very, very careful about our own capabilities. I would echo with the secretary once again, that uh, if you want to uh, translate your capacities into capabilities, of course, you have to have a solid planning. And uh, quite, quite interestingly, that if you see Bangladesh has procured two main class submarines, and now uh, Myanmar has procured another submarine, and deep down, Singapore is in the process of acquiring their submarines too. So uh, last year, I was reading uh, Bangkok Post, and one very interesting statement came up that uh, Thailand is taking note of Bangladesh's submarine procurement as well as Myanmar's procurement. So I won't be surprised if we see that some sort of uh, underwater uh, arms race is coming up. And if that is the case, we will have to be further serious about our preparedness, both diplomatically as well as uh, the military. So therefore, uh, obviously, the onus lies on both the armed forces as well as the foreign ministry to really work uh, in concurrence so that uh, there is an integrated response uh, to salvage or perhaps to protect Bangladesh's strategic autonomy. And that's exactly where we are standing right now. Does it answer, uh, DG? Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yes. Thank you very Th much. Thank very you, nice Professor time. Khan, for your wise comments. Now, let me give a minute to our other panelists, uh, uh, Professor Salim Rahan, if you have some last thought to share. Uh, just to thank you, Professor Bijan. Uh, I just want to add one point here. We need to actually uh, strike a balance between the strategic uh, objective as well as the economic objectives because. Uh, if we look at Bangladesh history over the last five decades, one advantage Bangladesh actually enjoyed that it had very low level of uh, conflicts with its neighboring countries. Uh, if you compare India, Pakistan, if you compare other countries, which Professor Shah and Am Khan, he mentioned, that Bangladesh actually enjoyed that benefit that not to be engaged with, con uh, not to be engaged with other countries in terms of conflict, so that actually Bangladesh should concentrate on its economic development or economic growth and poverty reduction more than any other countries in this region. So I think that uh, focus should be there. And uh, definitely as we are entering into new phase of development, uh, ocean economy, probably the areas of conflicts will be widened too. So I, I can see that we need to strike the balance and uh, we need to have the focus, right kind of focus so that we are not derailed into uh, kind of, you know, the situation where the other neighboring countries got into and they completely lost their priorities. I think that is the warning I would like to highlight towards the end. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Rahan. Yeah, thank you. Though we have some other comments on the chat box about marine pollution, plastic pollution, we will not further discuss about that. We can discuss bilaterally. So before giving uh, the floor to Ambassador Karim, let me wrap up with a few comments as the chair of the session. Uh, we had a long discussion. Uh, the discussion began with uh, our, ambas, our vice chancellor's comments that we have two scenarios. Certainly, will not go, should not go with the first scenario. We are up for uh, the second scenario that he depicted, and for that, I think perspective, we need to develop a long-term comprehensive uh, development strategy on the exclusive economic zone. And I think this strategy should have uh, first the a geo, a strategic element, because if the geostrategic element is not taken care of in the Bay of Bengal, which is a very strategically uh, soft area, then we cannot pursue other elements of that strategy. Then comes the focus of our discussion today, the economic importance of the Bay for Bangladesh. Exactly, this is extremely important because as Professor Wahiduddin Mahmud says, that Bangladesh is one of the few countries in the world which has uh, one of the most intensive economy in terms of producing the amount of GDP uh, in a one uh, unit area. So from that sense, we are kind of land-based economy saturated. The, from that perspective, I will ask the government and all the stakeholders to look to the south, uh, as uh, uh, I think Admiral Sarwar has referred to, and uh, also the DG of Bimrat. 
uh, and the keynote speaker that we have to look south. And for that, government and all the stakeholders together need to create an enabling environment so that capacity can be turned into capability. And technology, uh, scientific and technological ele uh, element is very, very important in that strategy. Then also we have to look at the social dimension because huge number of people live on coastal resources, fisheries and uh, marine tourism, which has got great potential, uh, still not very developed. I'm not going to repeat all those. Finally, the element of education and capacity building research. This is extremely important because uh, even Robinson Crusoe with having uh, good capabilities can survive. Uh, in, in an island, you know, uh, uh, if, even if he's a stranded. So this capability is extremely important to develop. And we need to focus on these, uh, not just through formal education, but also through other means of capacity building. And in that context, I will refer to the tripartite agreement that we have between uh, IUB, BIMRAD, and ICAT. So together, I believe that these three institutions, we can go a long way to take care of all these elements of a long-term strategy. So with these remarks, uh, let me have the privilege to hand over to Ambassador Tariq Karim. Okay, so Ambassador Karim. Thank you, Chair. Uh, it's, it's been a very, very enriching and enlightening. Uh, Ambassador Karim, yes. uh, before people start uh, dropping uh, off, can we ask all the participants to switch the cameras on so we can have a screenshot for our PR purposes? So please, all the participants, turn the cameras on. We want to see you. We'll take a screenshot and then... Uh, yes, yes, screenshot. that would be. Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Actually, I noted that point that before I signed off, I would make this. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, for reminding me. <laughs> sure. uh, so, yes. Uh, so, please have, uh, please come on, everybody on camera. The right. speaker, panelists. Yeah, even the participants, you know, the, 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 who, who did not speak, but who, who are here, please. If okay. You, yes, call, please. For our records, yes, thank you. And while I'm speaking, please do that. So before we sign off, we will we will take this a screenshot. Our IT department will, will be doing that also. Uh, all that's left for me after this very, very enriching and enlightening uh, almost two hours. And, mm -hmm. and this has by far been the most uh, enlivened session that we have had uh, so far. Uh, the whole purpose of the of designing this series was actually precisely what uh, uh, Admiral Alam and others have said. We need to be more aware of this new uh, uh, zone that is that has cropped up. And and you know, uh, Admiral Khurshid Alam, you and I, we worked together in the initial stages when we set off on that journey of you know uh, good fences make good neighbors. And that was precisely our idea, that if we can stop uh, uh, spending energy and time on resolving uh, our problems with our neighbors, we can focus on development. And that is what enabled, actually, the Bangladesh transformation story once we had done that. Uh, you know, I mean, people say, how did Bangladesh develop so fast? I would say that was one of the reasons. Uh, so thank you very much for coming on board. And I look forward to continuing collaboration with you. Uh, I can see that you have really devoted yourself to in-depth study of this. And all of us, particularly the country, will develop. Uh, you brought in not just the technical aspects, the geomorphological dimensions that are involved in the Bay, about which many people don't know. You brought in the connection that the blue economy is not just the uh, uh, aquamarine blue of the Bay of Bengal. It's also the blue of the rivers, because it's the rivers that make the bay. And, and the two interact on each other. So we need to find the, the symbiotic relationship between these two and how they affect each other also. That's something that is 
often very neglected. It has consequences for factors that uh, the other two speakers have also uh, highlighted on. Um, uh, Professor Salim Rehman and Professor Shahab Inam Khan admirably complemented each other. And that is what I was hoping they would do. Professor Salim Rehman is a noted economist who has focused his, his energies on the economy of South Asia, whereas Professor Shahab Inam Khan, a, a member of the Department of International Relations, is a strategic thinker and an expert in political economy. And, and everything, whatever we say, everything in this part of the world hinges on how we address our economic problems. One clear thing that came out is A, we need to look at things holistically. We have to move away from the silo approach. Nothing works on its own. We all live in uh, splendid, isol uh, isolated ivory towers. We need to connect those towers. B, we need not just the integrated approach, we also need to think in terms of anticipation. This was one of the fundamental lessons I learned when doing my graduate studies and then teaching uh, ecological security. Uh, anticipatory thinking has to be, has to underline every exercise you take in either devising regulatory frameworks or devising advice to policymakers. Your framework cannot be five years or 10 years. It has to be 50 years or 100 years. What you do will affect your next generation and several next generation. Conversely, what others do will affect you for the next generation. And therefore, that is why anticipatory thinking, this is something which we have forgotten. We hope that this process, this partnership that we have between our three organizations will help the government to be able to engage in that. And, and it will be able to come forward with actionable ideas that are future looking, not just looking about tomorrow or the next elections, but looking for, the, for, the, for sustaining. Uh, you know, I, I get alarmed when people say we need to exploit or, uh, 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 you know, uh, we need to uh, 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 retrieve these resources. We also need to conserve these resources. And, and they conserve them. We should not end up doing what we have done, what I've always kept saying, with the green economy or the brown economy on land. We need to conserve what we still have not untapped. And I'm so happy to hear from Admiral Alam that you know our fishery stock is almost the same as it was several decades ago. The, yes, and, and of course, Bangladesh can only develop, as you have rightly pointed out, we need to not just develop the capacity, you know, uh, but we also need how to convert that capacity into capability that will be useful. So I thank everybody over here. I thank our, our, my our colleagues at the IUB who helped to put this together te uh, technically and worked very hard to make this series come and work the way we designed it to. I thank our media partners who are helping to bring this basically a, a, a mystified, mythical subject. Uh, it's esoteric in nature. It doesn't excite the uh, imagination. It doesn't have sex appeal, uh, if I may use that word crassly, into the realm of how it affects everyday lives of our citizens and the future. So they play a very important part, and that's why we decided consciously that we need to engage the media in this. And first, uh, last of all, uh, I'm, I'm very gratified by the participation. I see there are, you know, they, this has an implications for our landlocked neighbors, as well as for all the literal neighbors. The Professor uh, Shahab Inam Khan brought out this aspect that had exactly what I had in mind, that we need to think beyond the existing framework of institutions we set up today. They, they had limited uh, scope of operations. They defined, they constrained themselves by the limited terms of reference they set for themselves. We need to look beyond BIMSTEC Plus. And that is where the Bay of Bengal, maybe one day, I don't know, maybe one day, 
we will evolve towards developing a Bay of Bengal community. But we, for that, we need to put in place a governance structure, a set of regulatory framework, which will work not only for Bangladesh, for our own uh, uh, maritime domain, but everybody else will be involved. So with those remarks, I thank you once again. The next, the final uh, webinar in this series on the 6th of October, which brings in the regional dimensions of this, of this commerce that we are talking about. Uh, is this just Bangladesh or is this, you know, are all the other countries involved? What, what is happening in the Bay of Bengal? Is it happening only because of us or to us or is it to everybody else? And from there, I agree and I completely, I, I, that's why I said I hope we'll continue working together because you will be a very important component of this, uh, uh, Admiral Alan. Uh, how we will design the forward-looking uh, uh, template of our activities and discussions, bringing in the investors, bringing in the private sector. Right now, again, as I said, it's an esoteric subject. You know, if you tell them, so what do you mean Bay of Bengal? You know, we are, we are already there. But looking into it deeper is what demystifying aspects of it will be our ultimate goal. Thank you very much. I hand it back to the chair to close the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Karim, for your uh, excellent last erudite comments. So uh, we have passed over two hours of our session today, though we are scheduled for 90 minutes. But we thoroughly, I personally thoroughly enjoyed and hope you all thoroughly enjoyed. We had a galaxy of participants, including the uh, speaker and two panelists. So our again, thanks to all of the participants. We look forward to seeing you in our next events. Thank you. Have a nice time. Stay safe and well. Goodbye for today. Thank you, sir. Yes.